As you know, we're in the midst of a series entitled uh, Mythbusters, and we're taking a look at some of the common myths or beliefs that creep into the Christian church and become truth, get passed down from generation to generation, and no one really seems to question them. And what we're doing is examining them. Are they really biblical? Uh, and more importantly, and just as importantly, are they really healthy for us to be believing? And so as we go through this series, we're looking at six of the most common myths that we tend to believe that have been passed down and, and creep around the church and often wreak havoc in the lives and in the faith of Christians. So let's pray, and we'll jump in. If you have a worship guide with you, you can follow along with us on the back of your worship guide. There's a spot for you to take some notes, and we'll be working through the myth that a valley uh, means a wrong turn today. A valley means a wrong turn. Let's pray. Father, we love you and are so thankful uh, for the gift of your presence in our lives, for the blessing it is to gather as your church in this unique way to encourage one another, to sharpen one another, to serve one another. Lord, to be encouraged by your truth and to be sharpened by who you are. And just sing these songs to you reminds us of what's most important in our lives. Lord, as we go through this series and as we uh, go through this message today, I pray that the truth of your word, that the, we shall know the truth and the truth will set us free, will resonate in our hearts. That many of the fears that we allow to creep in and often shape some of these beliefs that we have, these myths that creep in, would be confronted with the truth. And no longer would we live by fear, but we'd live by your truth and by faith in it. Lord, use your word and your Holy Spirit today to instruct us, and to transform us. We ask this in your son's name, I pray. Amen. Believing a myth will mess up your life. Last week I shared a personal example of it, but there's many myths that have crept into the church that often mess up our lives. Uh, some of you are here, and because you believe that the myth that God has a blueprint for your life, a perfectly detailed plan that you've got to figure out what it is and follow it perfectly. Because you've believed that myth and bought into that myth, you're feeling crippled and almost unengaged in his church. Because you have, at some point in your life, like all of us have, made a poor decision, something you knew wasn't right, and you're off the blueprint. And you're feeling like, man, I've blown it. I'm so far off the blueprint. There's no way that can be corrected. And I've blown it. I can't get back in God's will. I have to figure out where it is. I've got to find it. And so it's crippled you in your walk with God as well as your engagement in his church. Because believing a myth will mess up your life. Others of you have believed the myth that God brings good luck. And you've just made God and the church close enough in your life, you keep it engaged just enough to keep God on your good side, to be lucky with him, so to speak. But there are hundreds of people in our community today that aren't worshiping today because they believe the myth that God brings good luck. And suddenly, their luck ran out. Maybe it was an unexpected death in their family an unforeseen financial crisis, a health issue, a divorce that caught someone by surprise. Whatever it is, their luck suddenly ran out. And when they needed God the most, his luck seemed to be nowhere around them. And rather than questioning the myth that they believed, they instead just walked away from God. Others of you are here today, and you bear the scars of the myth that forgiving means forgetting. And you've beaten yourself up because you feel like you have to forgive anyone that's hurt you, and that that forgiveness means you forget everything that they've done, and you immediately restore them to the exact same place in the relationship that they once held. And that myth has beaten you up over and over again. And as a result, you feel like a punching bag or a doormat because while you're forgetting what that other person has done against you, 
they don't ever seem to forget the unhealthy patterns that continue to hurt you. Believing a myth will mess up your life. And that's what this series is all about. Busting myths that have crept into the Christian church and wreaked havoc on Christians. Hurt us and harmed us because they're not truly biblical. Today's myth is, is one of those myths that may be the oldest myth in the Bible. In fact, it's in what scholars believe to be the oldest book of the Bible, the book of Job, which is believed to be the oldest uh, written document book part of the Bible. Uh, and that myth that we're going to look at today was prevalent even back then. In fact, if you've ever read the book, you know that Job goes through some difficult trials and each of his friends comes to him and basically talks to him using this particular myth. That, Job, you must be in the midst of this valley. You must be in the midst of this trial because you've sinned against God. They believe that myth, that a valley must mean you've taken a wrong turn. And today my goal is to bust that myth and show you a more proper biblical perspective on trials and how they can come into our lives and why God allows them into our lives. So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 12 today and show you how God's busted this myth that a valley or a trial must mean that you took a long turn. turn. And then after we've busted it, we're going to take a look at why. Why does God allow trials in our lives? And we'll look at four specific reasons. There's others, but four key specific reasons as why God allows trials into our lives. Hebrews chapter 12 is where we'll start. Here's my opening premise for you. Jot this down. It's in your notes. Trials are not always the result of disobedience. That's what we set out to establish today, that trials are not always the result of disobedience. In order to do that, I want to break them into two different things, and I want to establish what still is true. Most, most myths are based on some truth, so it is true that some trials do come into our lives because of disobedience. So that's the first thing we're going to look at here is that God does use trials to correct our disobedience. He does use trials to correct our disobedience. So that's correct. It's just only part of the truth. Hebrews 12 is the best example. There's many other places I could take you, but our point isn't to establish that. Most people already believe that. I want to bust the myth that all trials are the result of discipline. So let's read Hebrews 12, starting in verse 5, and see what uh, God left us in regards to this issue of trials and, and disobedience. He says, Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? He's speaking as God does to children, sons or daughters. He says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. He's quoting from the Proverbs here. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. So reproving is when you're correcting someone who's in the wrong. So he's saying, don't regard that lightly by the Lord or be weary when he reproves you. And he tells us why. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises, there's that idea of, of, a, of a correctionary discipline, and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? It's a rhetorical question. There isn't a son that a father loves that he doesn't discipline. And then he makes this conditional statement. Listen to this very closely. If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. The Bible actually says here, those who experience discipline from the Lord are actually his sons. The people that should be most concerned are the ones that go on sinning and never experience any discipline because it means they don't have a heavenly father that's loving them. They're not one of his children. The devil's not going to discipline you for sinning. He wants you to do that. But God will. Just like any good father is going to discipline a son or a daughter that he loves. So this passage shows us, yes, God does bring trials. He brings difficulty. He brings discipline in our lives when we disobey. That is absolutely true. 
but it is not the only truth in the scriptures. The second thing that I want to show now is that God also allows trials even in our obedience. God also allows trials even in our obedience. And I'm just going to give you a quick survey of several of them, but there's a bunch in the scriptures, both examples as well as principles. Okay, the first one that starts in the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 46, we see this interaction between God and Israel or Jacob. If you remember the, the third son, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob was the one who eventually uh, went into Egypt, and he was renamed Israel. God gave him the name Israel, which is where the nation of Israel's name comes from. Uh, here he's talking to him about uh, a situation shortly after J- Joseph was sold into slavery, as we know, in Egypt, and now God is telling Israel or Jacob to take his family and go and move to Egypt. Okay, and here's how he says it. He says, So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. And God spoke to Israel, or Jacob, in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here I am. Then God said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. For there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. He's just saying you're going to end up, you'll die there, and Joseph will be there to to bury you, to, to put you to rest. So God's telling Jacob to move to Egypt. He's telling him to go down there. That's where I'm going to make you into a great nation, and I will be with you when I go. But what happened in Egypt? We all know the story, right? Was it cookies and cream for the Israelites, and a bed of roses, a nice smooth, they lived in the beautiful condos and all the penthouses all around Egypt? No, they ended up becoming slaves for hundreds of years, an incredibly difficult trial for the Israelites, one in which came from Jacob's obedience in moving his people to Egypt. That's one example. Exodus, I'll I'll just put the references on these. I won't give you the whole passage. It takes too long, long to read them, but here's two you can jot down. I think they're in your worship guide. Exodus 14 and Daniel 6. Here's two common stories. One of them, Exodus 14, is the Israelites on the backside of Egypt. Okay, they've now been brought out of Egypt. God's done all the miracles in Egypt, and he's brought them out, and they were wandering just into the desert a few days, and God then tells them, he says, hey, go back and head toward the Red Sea. And God pins them, if you know that area geographically, he kind of pins them into the corner with geographic structures on either side of the Red Sea there. And now their backs are against the Red Sea. And then God hardens Pharaoh's heart and sends Pharaoh back after him. And in this little section, if you read it, you'll see that the Israelites start whining and complaining. They go, oh my goodness, here we've been led to the sea. We're at a dead end. We're stuck here. And they start complaining to Moses saying, is this why you brought us out here? There there weren't enough grave sites in Egypt, so you brought us out here to be slaughtered and, and killed here? And yet God brought them to that point. He led them, told them to go there in order to reveal to them in that trial, in that difficulty, how powerful he is. And we all know the story. But we love the back end of the story. We love hearing about someone else going through the story, don't we? But we don't like to be in that scenario ourselves. Oftentimes, God leads us into a trial through obedience so that he can show us who he is. Daniel 6 was much the same. Do you remember the story of Daniel? Daniel was one of the uh, government leaders at that time under the king of Babylon, and he was a believer in the true God, but Babylonians believed in all kinds of other gods, and so a lot of the other satraps is what they were called, or, or uh, helpers, the key leaders that gave counsel to the king, they didn't like Daniel. They were jealous of him because God had shown him favor and the king had shown him favor because of how wise he was and how God was using him. And so they created a a rule for 30 days that no one could pray to any other God except the king of Babylon. And for 30 days, no one could do that. And they did it specifically because they knew that Daniel prayed to his God multiple times a day. And the king 
set that order, that edict in place. And immediately when Daniel heard about it, he was troubled. He went back to his house and he got on his knees and he prayed to his God. And those other leaders knew that he was going to do that. And they followed him, they caught him, and they turned him into the king. And because of his obedience to pray, to to continue to seek the true God and not the God that they had said he should seek, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. His obedience led him in to the trial. I think many of us are familiar with that story. Here's another uh, example, maybe one of the clearest examples in the scriptures. In fact, a whole book that's dealing with this issue is the book of Job. In the beginning of the book of Job, we see this. It says, and the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Look at how God speaks of Job. There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. So did Job sin to walk into the trial that he experienced? Just the opposite. God was holding him up as an example of obedience and turning away from evil. And then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? He goes on to say, You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Basically, what Satan's accusing Job of is saying, hey, the only reason he's following you is Job believes in a good luck God. As long as he does what you say, all his life is going to be blessed. But he said, but you take that away and you'll find out Job doesn't love you, God, for who you are. He's just doing this religious thing because he thinks it'll make his life blessed. That's what his challenge is. And God says, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hands. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. You can read the rest of the story to see what happened. As Satan gradually began stripping things away from Job, testing to see, did he really love God and the one who gave him those things, or did he just love the things themselves? But Job did nothing in terms of sin to lead him into that valley. It was his obedience that actually brought the valley about. Second Timothy says it this way. Here's one of Paul's statements and principles about this. Said, indeed, he says, all, not some, not most, not a few, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So that's the contrast of those who desire to live godly. But he says, in contrast, while the evil people and apostles will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, they'll continue to do what they do and even prosper from it in the world that we live in. That's the prince and the power of this air uh, rules over. But if you desire to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. Sometimes by other people who reject God, sometimes by the world we're in, but even ultimately by the great persecutor himself, like Job experienced, Satan himself. Satan wants nothing more than to destroy God's children. And so anyone that wants to live according to God's plan in his ways will experience his persecution. Lastly, we see an illustration in Jesus' life. Matthew 4, 1, right after Jesus was baptized, it says in the first chapter of Matthew, then Jesus was led up by who? The Spirit. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You know that one of Jesus' greatest trials was that 40-day period where he was being tested and tempted in the wilderness in many different ways while not having any food. It was the spirit that led him into that. It was his obedience that brought him into that valley. So what we can see, I think, from these many passages, and there's many, many more, is that this is simply a myth. A valley means a wrong turn is not true. It's busted. It's not true. It can result in it. I mean, a a wrong turn certainly can lead you into a valley, but it doesn't mean definitely that that's why you're there. In fact, there's plenty of examples where it's not. So if that's not the case, if it's not that simple, that we can just say, hey, just stop doing whatever you did wrong and you'll get everything back. If it's not that simple, we have to ask the question, why? 
Why in the world would God allow trials or suffering or difficulties into the life of a person who's actually being obedient? I want to give you four very clear reasons in the scriptures for why God allows trials into our lives because this can help us in facing them and walking through them when they come. Why does God allow trials when we have obeyed? The first is this, trials build endurance. Trials build endurance endurance. James says this in James chapter 1. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That's a a biblical word for endurance. In fact, some of your Bibles probably translate it endurance. Trials do that. Do you know that for an athlete, there's only one way to build endurance? Did you know that? There's only one possible way to build endurance in an athlete. It's for them to endure. That's, I know, not that complicated, right? When you're coaching track athletes, as I coached track athletes and and was building their endurance, you'd start them running two miles. And if you needed to get them up to five miles, then you'd have them run three miles the next week. Then you'd have them run four miles. What are you doing? You're teaching them to endure for the whole race. And the only way you can teach endurance is by having them endure. Not rocket science. True in any area of our lives, not just physically. God is teaching us to endure spiritually. That's one of his purposes for us. And so the only way to teach us to endure spiritually with him is to allow us to endure a trial. I love how D.A. Carson puts it in his book, How Long, O Lord, a book about uh, trials and suffering. He says this, he says, like the discipline of physical training, suffering produces perseverance. This is not a universal rule, for suffering can evoke muttering and unbelief. But when suffering is mingled with faith and with delight in being reconciled with God, it then produces perseverance. Now listen to his last statement here. It's very powerful. He says, The staying power of our faith is neither demonstrated nor developed until it is tested by suffering. Did you catch that? The staying power of our faith is neither demonstrated nor developed until it is tested by suffering. Trials build endurance. The second thing we can see in the scriptures of why God allows trials is that trials build character and maturity. Trials build character and maturity. That's what grows us up. Good times and ease rarely, if ever, reveal or develop character. They just don't. Just try it in your kids. Giving your kids everything that they want and making their life as easy as possible does not reveal their character, nor does it develop their character. Instead, it produces a spoiled brat, doesn't it? Okay? But, but well, we can say, well, but that's our kids. But, but for me, God, you can give me everything that I ask for, and you can make my life easy because, I mean, what? We want and realize for our kids what we don't want to accept oftentimes for ourselves. Ease and comfort never reveals, nor does it develop our character. Trials develop our character and build it in maturity. James says it this way in that same passage we looked at later on. He says, and let steadfastness or endurance have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Those words mean to to be matured, to become what you were intended to become. God allows those in trials and allows us to endure so that we become or we mature into the person, the man or the woman that he's called us to become. There's a certain kind of maturity, D.A. Carson says, there's a certain kind of maturity that can be attained only through the discipline of, of suffering. Trials build character and maturity. Third thing is trials test the genuineness of our faith. Trials test the genuineness of our faith. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1. And in fact, the, the epistle of 1 Peter is a, is a 
epistle purely about this idea of, of God's trials bringing us to maturity, making us into the men and women that we want. The whole book is really addressing that issue. But he says at the beginning in 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7, he says, In this you rejoice, though for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. Why? So that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes through its tested by fire, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter's talking about praise and glory and honor that Jesus will give to you when you prove faithful in a trial. It's the tested genuineness of our faith. Is our faith in this world and the things that we're losing here, or is our faith in the world to come? And what we know we can never lose. What never perishes. You see, trials are how God purifies his sons and daughters. It's how he purifies his church. Trials distinguish true and false Christians, and they purify believers. Just think about that. God allows them to both purify us. When you go through a trial, we'll talk about this more in a minute, it bubbles to the surface our issues, the idols that we have in our life, the things that we're putting our hope in. And it allows us in a true Christian who has trusted God to remove their faith from the things of this world and place it more fully on God. That's what a trial does. It purifies us individually. But you know what? It also purifies us as a body. As we go through trials as a church, as we face more difficult times, which I believe we will be facing as believers in our world, as as our country becomes less and less uh, kind toward Christians, it's going to purify our church. A lot fewer people will be coming who think that God's just here to make their life easy and comfortable and they haven't really trusted God, what they really trusted in in the things of this world, but they think God is their means to getting their real God, which is money and pleasure and relationships. Those people will no longer be around when it's not pleasurable to be a Christian. That's how God purifies his church. It tests the genuineness of our faith because trials force you to take a stand and they reveal what you truly put your hope in. You see, if your faith in God is only there when things are good, then your faith is really not in God at all. Your faith is simply in yourself. Because if you don't have a God that you allow to change you, if you don't have a God that you allow to purify you, then you really don't have a God. You've simply created yourself as a God, and you're the standard, and you've put your faith in yourself. Now, you call it that thing God, but it's really not God. It's just your idea of how things should be, and as long as it goes that way, you worship. But if you truly worship a holy God, if you truly worship a God who's revealed himself in scriptures, then you must come to realize that he has the right and the permission to change you and purify you. And the way he's chosen to do that is through trials. You see, if you don't believe in a God who has the right to change you or purify you, then you don't believe in any God at all. You simply believe in yourself. Trials remind us that we are not God and that we're a work in progress, that God, not us, knows ultimately what is best. The last thing we see about why God allows trials is that trials produce hope in future glory. Trials produce hope in future glory. Only when we realize that this world, this present world, can't fully satisfy us or save us will we put our hope fully in the next. It's when we struggle over and over again with the difficulties here and allow them to so discourage us to the point where we want to just completely give up or we do give up that we realize that our hope really isn't in God. It's in this world. But when we allow a trial to strip us of the things that we put our hope in and place that hope in the only thing that is sure and perfect and will endure forever, 
They produce a deeper hope than anything this world can ever produce. Just as we sang, no sorrow, no pain. They will will have them here, but in the next world, it will be perfect. None of those things will be present. Trials produce hope and future glory. Peter said it this way, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 7 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Then he says this, in this, in what? In this, in this living hope, in this inheritance, in this unfading, imperishable glory in heaven, in that hope you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. Those trials deepen our hope in what's to come. Paul said it this way in in Romans chapter 5, He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. There we see that again. Endurance produces character. We see that again. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. God allows trials when we obey to build these things in our lives. Maybe no better example exists than the only perfect sinless person who ever lived. Jesus himself. He never sinned. And yet, he endured many trials while he was on earth. In fact, the author of Hebrews pens these words that have always just blown my mind every time I read them. He says, in the days of his flesh, meaning when Jesus was here on earth as a human person, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. It says, even Jesus, who is sinless, learned obedience through the things he suffered. He never sinned, and yet he suffered while here as a person. His perfect endurance and steadfast hope and what awaited him on the other side of the cross is what empowered him to joyfully endure the cross for you and for me. He is our perfect example. And he willingly walked through the trials of this world in order to forgive you and to forgive me who often fail in the midst of those trials. He is our perfect hope, our perfect example and the one to whom we look to when we find ourselves in the midst of one of these trials. His unshakable satisfaction for his father was revealed in his willingness to experience the loss of everything here on this earth. And his willingness to suffer for our sake reveals that he puts his comfort below his obedience. And his love for us was greater than anything he could ever receive and achieve in this world. No one, not once, did he choose a shortcut that was necessary to avoid the path that was chosen for him. So how do we go through trials? Here's three simple questions I want to give you. Not answers, but questions. Because oftentimes there's not clear answers, but I think there's good questions that can help us when we're in the midst of them. How should I respond when I find myself in the midst of a difficult trial? Here's one question. Do I know why I'm here? Do I know why I'm here? 
asking that humbly and honestly. Have I done something honestly that's led me into this trial? Have I sinned in a clear way that's brought this trial out? And is there a logical connection? Usually there is. God doesn't give you one trial in order to address something that's totally unrelated. If it's a relational sin, you're usually walking through a relational trial. If it's a financial sin, you're usually walking through a financial trial. You can see that over and over in the scriptures. Have the humility to ask yourself, do I know why I'm here? Maybe yes, I do, and maybe don't. Maybe no, I don't. The second question is, how should I respond? How should I humbly respond to this trial? If it is sin, the Bible says repent. Turn away from it and, and change in that area that's bringing that about. Seek the help you need to start walking on the path that's best for you. If it's not sin then the Bible would encourage you to persist and grow, trusting that this trial is maturing you and growing you up. And that leads us to the last question. I think it's a good one to ask when we find ourselves in the midst of this, is what can I learn? What can I learn about myself? And what can I learn about my Savior? Let me put it this way. I think every trial, when we ask ourselves, what am I learning about myself in this trial? I believe the most important thing we can learn in a trial is what idols do I have in my life that I've put before God? What things that that in, in my suffering, what am I having to lose, what am I having to let go of that's so important to me that makes this experience as difficult as it is? Because those are usually the things that we have elevated in a place in our lives that's greater than God. It may be a relationship, and you're experiencing some trials in in a marriage because you've elevated that other person to a position that's greater than God. You're more concerned about what they think about you than what God thinks about you. And so he's bringing some trials into your marriage to purify you and help you put God where he belongs as number one and that spouse in that second seat. Maybe it's a financial trial. And you haven't done anything wrong in particular, but you've realized that you put a lot of hope in your portfolio and your financial status and, and, the, and the things that it affords you in our community. And God's saying, I need to remove that. I need you to realize that there's nothing wrong with having resources, but when they become your God, that's deeply unhealthy for you. And so I'm going to purify you until you recognize that it's not those resources that bring you blessing, it's me. You can go on and on down the list of idols that often surface when we're in the midst of a trial. What can you learn about yourself and let God change you there so that you become who he wants you to become? Lastly, what can I learn about my Savior? What can I learn about my Savior? Maybe most importantly, when you find yourself in a trial, is to remember the trials that he endured for you and me. Because even the worst trial that any human being has ever experienced will never compare to the trial he walked through undeservedly for you and for me. And so when you find yourself in the midst of deep loss and deep pain, it can turn your eyes to Jesus who experienced even deeper pain for you and for me. It can open your eyes to the depth of his love for you. And he endured it willingly and joyfully for the sake of reconciling you and me to our Heavenly Father. Trials are difficult but they aren't always the result of a wrong choice. I want to close today just reading a benediction out of 1 Peter 5, a wonderful verse that I think is a great one. If you find yourself in the midst of a difficult situation like this today, one that you can memorize, you can write, you can recite on a regular basis is a great hope. So let me just bow our heads now, close our eyes, and I'm going to read this verse and just pray to close today our message. 1 Peter 5.10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you 
to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen.